Welcome to Halftime. I'm Doug Piper, and I'm a Halftime alumni from Greenville, South Carolina in the USA. Now, this is our 45th live streaming event, and I want you to know how much I appreciate you joining us tonight. Well, and of course, I guess for those around the other parts of the world, it might be morning for our friends, especially in the Far East. So welcome. Halftime is the world's leading peer learning center for successful people who are in transition. We teach, coach, and connect leaders who are looking for more meaning, joy, and impact in their next season. Now, you can get in contact with us by clicking on the green button down there below, and that will email Lloyd if you've got some further questions or want to inquire about some of our programs. Now, most importantly, please vote in the polls because that's how we shape our future programming. So that's down there at the bottom. Just click on the polls. It'll take you 15 seconds to choose uh, some of the answers that we've got there. Now, I think you're really going to enjoy today's topic, how to find my purpose in life. If I'm successful here, I'll bring everybody else up on screen. Now, we have fellow halftime alumni, Cheryl Hunter, and she's going to share a systematic way for you to find your purpose in life. Now, Cheryl found a surprising and challenging and exhilarating calling applying her experience as an owner of McDonald's restaurants. Now, she got into the franchise business over 40 years ago with the International Dairy Queen. She then worked with McDonald's Corporation for 17 years. Then she was managing 300 restaurants in five departments. But after bumping into a glass ceiling, she decided to leave the corporate world and purchase <laughs> franchises of her own. Now, for 16 years, Cheryl owned and ran McDonald's restaurants in North Carolina. Now, one of the things she learned at McDonald's corporate office was the importance of operating principles and values. That if you can model values and articulate them with passion, then you can make a tremendous management impact. Now, today, she's passing those lessons on to other women entrepreneurs. Now, Cheryl, I can't wait to hear more about that. Now, we also have Halftime Institute's founding partner, Lloyd Reed. Now, Lloyd, we've discussed before that many of the people you've coached through Halftime have struggled to find something they're really truly passionate about. And the risk is that they can just dabble away in a variety of things and become, I think you call it, sloppy busy. So I understand, though, this past summer, you've been studying the science of how people cultivate their interests. Now, I can't wait to hear more. Can you elaborate? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Thanks for your friendship and partnership in doing these for our friends and fellow halftimers. Cheryl, thank you for joining us. I mean, it, it's been such a joy to be on the journey with you for all these years. I think maybe it's coming up on nine or 10 years since you went through halftime, maybe 2013. And I just remember uh, watching you noodle through how to take all these talents and experience of leading teams of young people to build, you know, great restaurants and award-winning restaurants. And and then trans that, uh, transition that into this next season. But, you know, I, I pick a topic every summer that I think is maybe the biggest challenge that our halftime friends and family uh, face. And this summer, so I study it for the whole summer because it really takes a whole summer to get deep into a topic, doesn't it? And so this summer I studied passion because so many people get stuck here. Either they have this preconceived idea that it's going to be something that just makes them laugh or cry every time they think about it. And maybe it's distorted in terms of what a passion really is, or maybe they, they just don't have the exposure yet to find something that really moves their, their uh, needle. Now. So a lot of people, like you said, Doug, end up sloppy busy and sloppy busy is, is not a derogatory term. It's just that your, your calendar looks full, but it doesn't have the focus and leverage and, and joy that you might have experienced at the very peak of your career. And so uh, what do you do about that? Now, for years, I have said that 
I believe your passions are often hidden under blankets of busyness, obligation, and responsibility. And that if we can help you lift the corner of the blankets and blow oxygen in there, that those passions will ignite. And then you'll be off and running. And for some people, that's true. But I've found that for many people, it's not true. And what happens often with half-timers is they have been so focused on what they've been doing and running their business and coming home and leading their family and taking kids to soccer and dance and all the other things that come with, you know, going to church and being in a small group and taking your spouse out for a date and um, that they just didn't gain the exposure to a lot of the biggest issues in our world or their heart didn't experience the pain or the joy of some of the things that are happening around the world. It's why often you hear someone say, well, I took a mission trip and it transformed my life because maybe for the first time they got exposed to something that really, really rocked their world at a deep and emotional level. So this summer I studied what is the science around the discovery of interest and passion. And I found to my surprise that for most people, it goes through stages exposure is the first stage, just getting exposure to a wide variety of things, even if it's just through research, not necessarily personal experience. And then it's reinforced from the outside as people affirm you. It's reinforced from the inside as you enjoy the experience until it becomes part of your identity. So because the challenge is for many of our halftime alumni is that they, they haven't been exposed to a wide variety of things, uh, we are working on ways that you can gain more exposure. And one of the ways is just simply to start exploring all the different needs you see in your own community. But, you know, from the compilation of science, there's, there's, a, there's a compilation called the science of interest that I dug deep into this year when I finally studied it this summer. And it goes from exposure to knowledge, to confidence, to joy and ex experiencing joy until it becomes part of your identity and then you're self-motivated to be a part of it. So let me turn it into a story for you to make that come alive. Let's suppose that a parent notices that their child is, is enjoying taking pictures of nature. And so they buy him or her uh, an inexpensive camera and the child goes out and takes pictures and some of them turn out to be really amazing. And they get the joy of affirmation from their family when they come in and show the picture. And so the mom, uh, buys a better camera for this child, maybe turns them onto a YouTube video about how to do better photography, nature photography. And the child goes out and takes even better pictures. And then she notices that he or she is out there in the sun when it's hot, out there in the rain taking pictures and sharing them with their friend. And before long, she hears the child describe him or herself to their friends as, I'm a photographer. That is more akin to how many people in halftime go through the process of discovering what they're really passionate about. So that has implications for us. And I've watched, Cheryl, I've watched you go through this. So talk a little bit about your journey, what some of your early thoughts were as you came to halftime and, and how this journey went for you in its early stages. Thank you, Lloyd. So I came to halftime right after I sold my restaurants and I found that I had about 60 hours a week of undedicated time that I had spent my whole life in a very organized and, and uh, planful fashion. And when I came into halftime, I had a, a couple of core principles that I knew that I wanted to achieve. I first of all wanted to be sure that I wasn't going to do retirement the way that you culturally hear we do retirement now. I just, I couldn't even say the word. I said redeployed for over two years because I didn't want to use the word retirement. It wasn't in my vocabulary. And then secondly, I had learned early in McDonald's um, that it was about the people. I remember one day putting my hand on the door of my high volume restaurant. And I said, God, why am I a hamburger flipper? Why am I doing this? And I opened the door and I heard the variety of languages coming out. And I clearly felt like this is your ministry is working with people with, within the business world and supporting them and encouraging them and developing them. So I had a clear understanding of what I love, the relationships with my employees. So when I went into halftime, I was excited because one more time, this was a planful 
procedural way to sort out what I wanted. And I, that is my personality. I love to plan. I love to think strategically and think about how I wanted to approach things. So I was so excited after my first meeting because I saw here's a way for me to go through this search and decide what it is I want to do in the second half of my life. The biggest impact I, I found was the low cost probes. When I retired, I think the phone rang for about three or four days saying, well, why don't you come and do this? Why don't you come volunteer here? Why don't you join this organization? And there was a lot of pull to get engaged with so many great, great organizations. But I sure was, wasn't quite clear what I wanted. And I, I started out working with one and it wasn't feeling good. And when you brought up the low cost probes, it was like having permission to try things for a short period of time. Because mm. once I commit, I don't want to back off. So mm. that getting that clarity and direction was just a sense of freedom for me to be able to look at things and to see what I wanted to do. So that was probably the, the first big aha with, with, um, with halftime. And after I went through the low cost probe, I was able to sort out the skill sets that I had, and what is it that I had a passion about. And so the second thing was coming up with that mission statement. And to this day, I still write that mission statement down at the beginning of the year and sort out where I'm going to go in the new year and follow that alignment because I wanted to go deep. I didn't want to go wide. Hmm. Well, and the low cost probe thing, you know, it's interesting because you really negotiate your way into an effective low cost probe. And it feels kind of bad to show up at a organization that's serving the poor or serving some somebody you know, and, and to say, well, it, can, it sounds pompous, right? To kind of say, this is my mission statement. These are my strengths. You've got I've got 10 hours a week. I can help you. I want to try something. I want to test it out. And then let's come back together in five months or three months and see if you like what I can contribute. And if I like how I can contribute and if this, if this brings joy to me. Um, but that, that's a way to gain quick exposure. And I think I've shared with you, Cheryl, that my first low cost probe was mentoring prisoners in, uh, you know, every Thursday afternoon. And after even just the first few times, I knew I was terrible at it. I mean, it was like a bad day in prison when I showed up. And now I've learned that I love working with people one-on-one. -on -one. I spend about a third of my time now doing that. But it was just, I couldn't relate to their journey. Now, it was good for me because it was humbling to go through that experience and not be good at something. But I'm so glad it was a low-cost probe. So uh, describe a little bit about what you're doing now and how you've built this portfolio of roles and the things you've done through Esperanza and that kind of. Okay. Well, I, I think um, I'll go back to, I've just, it's coming off the um, being COO of an organization called Open USA. And what Open USA does is support about 140 business people in the 1040 window. And they're business people who've moved there specifically to uh, give dignity through jobs in the workplace and share the gospel. And so um, I was able to step into that organization uh, because it, at that point it was pretty much a movement and they wanted to turn into an organization. So it worked out well. I followed them around for about a year and then I was invited to become the COO to put in process and procedures and build relationships. And it was just a great fit. And I did that for five years. And then I've been very engaged with Hope International. And some of you may know Hope International does microfinance in, um, with people who are very under-resourced in the poorest of the poor areas. And so I worked just alongside of, of them and attended their summits and things and they came forward and ask me to join the board of Esperanza, which is one of their partners. And Esperanza gives microfinance loans in only in the DR and they partner with Hope. So I spent six years doing that, a couple years as chair of the board. And I finished that up in June. And the third activity I have is um, I work with Mission Triangle. 
and that's a local uh, nonprofit here. And Mission Triangle specifically uses biblical business principles to teach nonprofits how to uh, become effective. Um, we had over uh, 1,000, 1,079 nonprofits start in Raleigh in 2020. Whoa, and we I didn't had know about that. that many, uh, just under a thousand, close their doors. And most nonprofits start out with a passion. They've got the heart. They know what they want, but they don't know exactly how to implement and apply it. And so that's what Mission Triangle does. We work with we're working with about just under 300 a year nonprofits and teaching them some core business principles, and we do it through coaching and accountability, and I'm chair of that group right now. And then finally, I do my individual coaching too. I have a couple of business people, I have an intern, and potentially um, a pastor. Um, we had our first meeting last week. So did I'm you, it, when you were doing the low-cost probes, did you did you stumble on stuff that you just knew you didn't like, that, that, that oh, got crossed yes. off? Yes. <laughs> so I remember one of my first ones was uh, getting involved with raising funds uh, for uh, purchasing a piece of equipment. And I was so excited. And I, of course, organized the banquet. I had women come in and actually cook the whole food, homemade food, did everything, it was gorgeous. And I just had a ball. And we raised the money. And then a month later, the nonprofit said, well, we've decided not to buy that piece of equipment. And I said, okay, are we going back to tell the people uh, that we're not buying? Well, no, we'll just use it for something else. And I, I just dealt, for me, that was such an integrity situation and I was very concerned. And so I said, okay, this is very good to know this up front. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's been some, there were some disappointments. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, with Mission Triangle, uh, the executive director came and said, I want you to get involved with us. And I said, I'm done with nonprofits. I said, I just can't deal with just the heart. I've got to deal with people who've got a heart and a head for implementing it. And it's too hard for me. And then he explained to me that's what they did. And it was, I was sold. After I, I hung out with them for a year before I joined, but then I was sold. Yeah. So that's just like layers of learning, right? from going from heads down running these businesses and then you've got a uh, you know uh, you you got a, a family that has a lot of moving parts in it and uh, keeping all those plates spinning to trying to figure out how do i retool myself and use all those skills uh, just thin slicing into it and i hope that that gives each of us listening, you know, the freedom to keep testing stuff out. Now, for some of you, you may go back to some pain of your past or something that's been hidden there since you were, uh, you know, young. And very often when you consider the archaeology of your life, something pops up that you may be passionate about. But if you're stuck, I hope that you're finding the freedom. And as you listen to Cheryl, to, to try low-cost probes. Write down a list of 10 or 20 different organizations that might be of interest to you. And then set up a time to interview them over the phone. Go research their stuff. Ask them for their strategy and their business plan. Look it all through. Talk to somebody who's doing something similar to what you're interested in. Shadow somebody for a little bit. And one of the things I do that I just did this morning with someone is I connect him with three or four people in their area. One of the guys I'm coaching, he wants to really get involved in mental wellness. One of his children has struggled with mental wellness. And so I, I listed four, four different people that I've coached that are involved in mental wellness in different ways. And he's set up, he's having interviews with each of them to figure out what they learned, what their network is, and, and what they would do if they were him. And, and you, you're just trying to thin slice your way into discovering something that you're passionate about. And it can take time. It, it requires patience. In fact, in our December webinar, we're going to talk about how, how you persist in this journey that Cheryl's uh, described for you. Cheryl, one of, one of the things about this journey is um, we're, you and I are like two friends on this journey, right? I mean, we've gotten close along the way and, uh, and we learn from each other, not just about how to make an impact, but how to do life. And 
a big part of what you're bringing to influence the leaders is who you are. I, I mean, everybody that I introduce you to, you, you probably don't know this, but I tell them, and Cheryl is one of the ladies I respect the most on this planet. Yeah. And, and that comes from my heart. And so one of the stories that was, has been most moving to me is the story of Zach in your life. And I'd like to just take a minute and, and, and have you share that with, with this group, because part of your influence in board chair of Esperanza leading these other ministries or the hundreds of organizations that mission triangle is impacting in Raleigh is because of who you are and your character and you, you, we win influence through that. So, so talk a little bit about your journey with Zach and his, his joining your family and what, what that's meant to you. Well, I'll probably take you all the way back. So I have four children. Uh, my oldest son I adopted at age 25 from Korea. He was nine months old. And then I had a biological child at 35 and then almost 50. I was 49. I was getting kind of restless, couldn't decide what I wanted to do with my life. And I decided to, to um, leave the corporation and purchase restaurants. And I said, oh, by the way, let's have another kid. And so I adopted a four month old from China at 49 and moved to here to North Carolina. And then in the course of our time here in North Carolina, uh, we met Zach, who was Korean by descent. Um, and he went to church with us and um, we spent almost every Sunday dinner with him and he got to be really close friends with my daughter. And well, when my daughter was um, getting married, she was fussing and I'm sure it was because I'd put a budget on the wedding. And Zach said to Catherine, shut up, at least you have a mom who loves you. And uh, Catherine turned to him and said, well, we'll adopt you. My mom will take anybody. And Zach had been abandoned by his uh, first family that brought him here from Korea. And he pretty much had been on his own since 13, uh, living by himself, working, uh, had a neighbor kind of watching out for him. And so Zach and I talked and I adopted Zach when, um, when, I was, when he was 25 years old. It was really great. A kid with his own house, his own job, no diapers. Um, it was it was great from that standpoint. But he needed a mom. Um, he had a lot of lot of wounds, a lot of um, uh, empty hole in his life. And the most joyous thing he wanted was a family. And uh, he said that to us often. I just love this family. I just love this family. And then about three years ago. He had had a hole in his heart when he came from Korea and had it repaired at Loma Linda in California. And um, his heart just wasn't strong enough. And so three years ago, we lost Zach. Um, but Zach had a profound um, footprint in this world for the short years he was here. He was one person I met who was totally without guile. With all this pain, he loved so well. And at his funeral, I counted it. Nine different guys got up and said, Zach was my best friend. Mm. And, um, and that's how Zach lived his life. So, but it was, it was a pleasure to have him in my life for 17 years and 12 and a half as my kid. So. <laughs> what a sweet story. Yeah. Gosh, I just, um, I just admire you so much. So Doug, take us into um, take us into the poll because the poll helps us know what parts of this uh, conversation are most helpful to our friends. It does. And I'm going to go read the questions. And if you haven't had a chance to answer the poll, please go in there and look and you can answer them very quickly. Now, as you consider what you are most passionate about, which of the following best describes your journey so far? I knew what I was passionate about from the very start of my halftime journey, and I've just refined it since then. The second answer is, I had a general idea to start, and I've been narrowing it down through experience. I'm not sure what I need to sustain this, though, for the long haul. Now, I've tried a lot of variety of things, but really nothing has grabbed my heart yet. And finally, 
I've not really done any experimenting because I'm just looking for something that captures my interest. So we're going to look at the poll and see what the answers, and Lloyd, it is very distinct. A hundred percent of the answers are question, or answer number two. I had a general idea to start, and I have been narrowing it down through experience. Yeah, now Doug, talk about your journey, because um, I love the way you discovered this passion and the courage with which you, which you explained it to your your uh, halftime cohort i mean it was so out of character what you did so take a minute and just tell us about your journey because this is exactly what you so, did but when i grabbed the mic <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly well well just briefly basically during my halftime round table I, I had a sense that i wanted to do something in media but I was really struggling with exactly how and what. And I really didn't nail it down in my round table and actually took several years after that. So I can really relate to the patience, Lloyd, that you're talking about because I was quite frustrated. I really thought at the end of my round table, I ought to have it and just, you know, go at it. And it took several years of low cost probes and then it's, I was faced with a really insurmountable challenge. And, and it required me to really dig down deep uh, to really break through this because I couldn't go any further till I figured that out. But interestingly enough, once I overcame that, I really found my groove, so to speak. Um, and, and looking back, getting into media now seems obvious to me, but you know, when I was in the round table with you, Lloyd, it was anything but obvious back then. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Doug has a parallel passion using the same what he's doing tonight for as a sommelier and um, in um, in beverages. And, and he's well known around the world. He's been a judge in Europe and other places. And and so he's getting kind of the two for one. He practices with his in his in his hobby what he can bring to his calling. But in his cohort, I remember him standing up one day and saying he actually stood behind a flip chart and practiced what he wanted to do. It was going to be a podcast about living extraordinary life. And what did you call it, Doug? What was the, what was the phrase? Amazing life. Yeah. And, and so this is what he's doing now. He's, he's sharing with you Cheryl's amazing life, but it took four or five years of iterations to, uh, to get here. So Cheryl, what do you, what would you say for if most of these folks are testing their way, they have a general idea, kind of like the aperture is narrowing and now they're trying to, you know, you've nuanced your role, right? From, and you found these roles as board chairperson. So, so how would you, what, how would you say over these last four, four or five years that you've tweaked it or dialed it in so that every, every thing you're doing seems like a, a perfect fit? I think one of the biggest things that I learned, um, it was frustrating because there were a number of failures and I was saying, my goodness, what am I going to do with all this spare time? Because I want to finish strong for the Lord. I really feel strongly about that. And at times I'd get frustrated. And I think one of the things I learned early on is the baby steps are what it's important. And I started out very slowly working with one person at a time, um, spending time with the Hope International developer and learning, just learning about her life and talking with her. And that opened other opportunities. And one of my prayers each week uh, is, Lord, help me see opportunities, because I think we can get so busy rushing through um, the grocery store, rushing here, rushing there, um, that we miss the opportunities. And one of the local jokes in my area is that the local coffee shop is my office. I had one businessman come in and put $5 down and said, can I rent a, rent a chair for an hour? And <laughs> I have met, uh, met so many people at that local coffee shop that have led to something else. And I think God has been so faithful to teach me that he shows up in the ordinary and he shows up in the little things. And I think when you have a platform where you've been a business owner or you've been an executive and you think that the next thing is going to be a big splash. 
it's starting with the little things and the ordinary. Hmm. Thank you. So Doug, sum up for us some of the, how, what we've learned, you know, this summer through this deep dive into the discovery of passions. Thank you, Lloyd. So as we wrap up, and the second part of this will be answering your questions. So while I'm summarizing this, you might want to click down there at the bottom of the screen, bottom center, and you can ask your question, and Cheryl will answer them in the second half. Here's a process that we're refining that may help you build your passion, a, a passion that becomes a part of your identity and may enable you to be self-motivated and engage for the long haul. First, explore. Define a step-by-step -step process to be exposed to a wide variety of causes and people groups that you might be interested in. Beginning with what you're most interested in already. You can do this through reflection, photos, lists, stories, case studies, maybe Google searches, halftime experiences, an urban plunge, or maybe even mission trips. The second item is learning. Define a step-by-step -step process to learn about the topics or causes that seem to you of most interest. Now, these could be topic study assignments, or we could, halftime can introduce you to leaders maybe in those space, uh, meetings with peers, halftime other alumni and thirdly assess set up time on your calendar to engage engage those low-cost interest probes and use a systematic way to record your feelings around both your contribution and the effect that you see in people's lives so these could be low-cost probe assignments a journal with joy exercise and discuss the experience with your family your friends, and your coach. So three things again, explore, learn, and assess. The fourth thing is share. Try to articulate your vision in an elevator pitch. You know those short pitches that we come up with that you've really got to have solid in your heart. And include your emerging passion as part of your identity. That's especially important. Write this out and practice it and include it in your bio, your LinkedIn profile. That helps you really grasp it and take it to heart. Now, next month, our webinar is going to be about this very last point, share. How to share your halftime message in a winsome way. So again, four items, explore, learn, assess, and share. And we look forward to seeing you next month on how to share your halftime message in a winsome way. Now, Lloyd, I think we're ready to go to the questions. Sounds looks good. Like, looks like we have two right now. So the uh, first question, Cheryl, is what was the filter that you used to know whether your low-cost probe was taking you in the right direction and or not? I think I built the filter into my mission statement and the filter that I used was to encourage and coach individuals to be all they wanted to be, all they saw they should be in the community, in the family, in their business, and for God's kingdom. And I think the filter is, that I used was they had to be more engaged and more involved in their journey than I was. I wasn't going to be pushing people to be all they could be. They had to have that excitement about it. And um, there's some coaching situations and, and areas I've turned down because they were looking for someone to do all the work when I felt it was my job to be an, a coach and encourager. And the work had to stay with the individual. And Doug, you know, we have some tools that we'll send to everybody that are low cost probe analyzers. I have one up on my screen right now that um, I saw that question just a few minutes ago. And so I brought it up on my screen and it's a little Excel spreadsheet and it's got criteria down the left side and then your one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, low cost probes. And I have somebody's example here that they gave me and 
and you just score it one to 10. And so for this person, for example, they didn't want a lot of travel. They were sick and tired of travel from their first half career in corporate America. So to what degree does this thing going to require me to travel? To what degree does it use my skills? To what degree does it involve my spouse? Because that was a high priority to them. Does it have a solid season team? Um, is, are, to what degree are these issues I deeply care about? And they align with my mission statement, like Cheryl said. And, um, you know, and is it scalable? So, so those are their criteria. So when you work with your halftime coach, they can use this low cost probe analyzer to just simply set out your filter and then compare all across them. And I, I've done this so many times. It's funny because you're not trying to get exactly right. But when you talk it through before you know it, two or three things surface and so many other ones go to the bottom. And so it's a little bit of science. It's a little bit of intuition. It's a lot of bit of, of listening to the spirit of God, right? The Lord says, I'll guide you with my eye. So I love the fact that the spirit of God has been guiding people to find their calling for thousands of years, long before halftime existed. <laughs> I like, I like in John one, six, it says there was a man sent from God. He was, his name was John. He came as a witness. That's his purpose. So that through him all might believe that was the desired results. So I think you can kind of lean into that, right, Cheryl? I think one of the important things too is sitting with people who know you well and asking them what they see uh, that you have to contribute, what they see um, you get excited about and, and getting input from others because sometimes we are blinded because we live inside our skin the whole time. But mm -hmm. how do others perceive you and what are they noticing? And that yeah. was very helpful. Well, you know, I pulled out an, uh, a letter uh, written in 1989 to Bob Buford by Peter Drucker where he described to him exactly what he saw in Bob's life. And it's interesting. He said to him, Bob, your life is important, not because you have money, but because you're defining a new form of entrepreneurship, a form of entrepreneurship that's tied to your personal contribution and not just the contribution of capital. What's interesting is he said, now what's important is by doing this it, early in your life, you have 30 years left to live out this purpose. And you know what I noticed recently, Cheryl, is Bob went to heaven almost exactly 30 years later. Oh, my. <laughs> is that strange? That is. That is. So who are the people that are looking over my shoulder, helping me narrow the scope of my contribution? Because they can see things that, that I can't see. And, and Bob needed Peter to tell him what he could see in him that was unique. Um, so, Doug, I think we have a couple more questions yes we do thank you on that was a great one uh lucas has our next question how long should low-cost probes last before i find my it i feel like <laughs> i've been on it for years <laughs> i feel i feel your pain gosh um cheryl what would you say from your experience well so each each person's experience is very personal. Um, I am, patience is not one of my strengths. And so I pushed myself to go a bit longer than I normally would because I felt like this was a time in my life where I needed to take some extra care. And so um, I found for myself that uh, one low cost probe was a few months and one was just a little over a year. Um, and I got up that day to walk away um, from the second one. And that's when they said, we don't like the way this is going. We need someone to organize it and turn it into an organization, not a movement. And then it was like singing in my ear. Uh, it was a great fit. So I think it varies depending on who you are and what your tolerance is. And also the um, the nonprofit or the ministry that you're looking at. And one of the things I find is that you've got to impose your calling into your calendar. You have to actually work it. If you just dabble at it around the edges, you may not get the deep experience to know whether it's good or bad. You know, by doing pr mentoring prisoners every Thursday afternoon back in 1990. 
after a few weeks, I, I could tell that this wasn't a good fit. And that's, because I didn't have good coaching, I, saw, I had already signed up for six months of it. And um, what I should have done is shadowed somebody and done some of it for, you know, just a, a month or a month and a half or two months. And but But what I find is many people do not stick it in their calendar. And if, you know, what I do when I stick something important in my calendar that I want to become a habit, I work with Priscilla and I say, let's say we're going to stick this in my calendar and you can move it, but don't remove it. So for example, my time with the Lord every morning is, is, is seven, seven 30. And, and I say, well, if I'm on a flight, you can move it, but don't, please don't remove it. And time with our grandbabies goes on a, a Thursdays and, and it can be moved. So if you want to stick your calling into your calendar, even if you have a busy career still, um, because our, you know, often our career and our calling all mix in together. Halftime is not about selling your business or quitting your job. It's about getting aligned with your calling at any age, really. It doesn't really need to be some magic number in the middle of life. If you're in your 30s listening to this, why would you wait to discover your calling, right? Now, it doesn't mean you have to be rich. It just means you have to be listening and you have to be available. It's more about availability than ability. So, um, Doug, what would you say from your experience on on how long to stick with something before you decide thumbs up, thumbs down? Well, it sounds like in both my situation and Cheryl's, it, it had to get worse before it got better. So... <laughs> I was actually going to ask you, Lloyd, how do you separate? And Lucas, I think, is asking exactly this question. Are you obsessed with your low-cost probe and you need to back off? Or is do you need to be determined to push it through? Because in my case, I had to over break through something. And it sounds like Cheryl had the, had a similar experience. So... But, but when is it an obsession and just this drive that an awful lot of executive has to not give up? Any suggestions mm. there? Yeah, that's really, that's really difficult, right, uh, Doug, because it's a discernment factor. So much of it's deep inside. I remember coaching a gentleman maybe even 20 years ago, one of the very first people I coached, and, and he had purchased a lot of land in a, in a poor country and he had this great idea to, to, you know, eradicate poverty in that region through better agricultural techniques. And, and a lot of the due diligence he would have done in his investment career, he didn't do because he was so enamored with this dream. And he, and he felt like it, that, that moving out of business into ministry was something mysterious. And so he didn't do all the normal due diligence and, and hung on for so long that it became, you know, he, he, he really uh, suffered in, in, in the end because he, just to your point. So I think to listen carefully to your heart uh, about why you're doing what you're doing and to have several law cost probes going. You know, I remember when I was developing real estate, sometimes we'd get enamored with a single piece of property. And the best way to not overpay for a piece of property is to go find two or three others that are just as sexy and, and that you can compare to and not get enamored with one. So one way to know if you're enamored is to go find something else that's equally as compelling to you and get involved in a little bit in it and then compare the two. And do you think we might have lost Cheryl, uh, Doug? You can probably tell. There she is. No, okay, go. no. <laughs> I, I wanted to make a comment about that too is I think one of the biggest transitions I had to make was not to throw out everything I knew from my business background and from my relationship background and think that nonprofits needed to be this unique, separate, whole new way of operating. I think God has called us to take what we know in our skills and apply them to the ministries. This whole, um, I, I grew up in this whole separation between sacred and secular and that, yeah, we can do a business this way, but we can't necessarily do a nonprofit this way. And it's not true. Our lives are pretty much aligned and God's given us skill sets that apply and fit. And if it's not fitting, then you maybe have the low, wrong low cost probe. And Cheryl, take a, this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but take a second and just illustrate the kind of cool stuff you've done through Esperanza in helping entrepreneurs spawn and break the cycle of poverty. 
Well, so Esperanza and Hope International give uh, very uh, low um, interest loans to people. And what happens with, with these loans, it's a cottage industry and it's really exciting. Probably, I don't have the exact figure, but well over 90% of the people who are uh, living um, in an under-resourced way are women. And so many of these women start businesses that are um, needed in the neighborhood. It might be a small store. Uh, it might be, we had, we had one person who was raising chickens and she would get up every morning and uh, uh, prepare the chickens and go through the neighborhood and sell uh, these chickens who'd been plucked and cleaned. And then, then she found out that she'd have some left so she'd fry them up and serve lunch. And before long, these individuals, a story after story, these individuals are um, paying for their kids' schools, are getting their kids into college, through high school and into college. And with these small cottage industries, they're buying a house or they're doing this. Especially in the Dominican Republic, we work with so many uh, Haitians who are um, have immigrated, immigrated to the DR and have no papers. And so they're being able to feed their family, clothe their family, and educate their kids. And it's so exciting. Yes. So for, for Hope and Esperanza, about how much, how many, how much money do they lend out to poor women in, in uh, hundred dollar increments roughly? Yeah. So um, I think that our portfolio in um, the Dominican Republic was just under $3 million, but they were all $150, $200 loans, a large percentage of them. We've done some expanding in, in um, Esperanza. We've done some water projects because water is such a big need. And then we've done some schools where we've loaned to schools. So lo those loans are getting a little bit larger. But more than half of our portfolio had to do with um, under-resourced uh, individuals, majority of them being women. Uh, I think Hope International is in a, just under 20 countries. And that varies country to country at the amount that they're giving out. But I don't remember, I don't recall their budget right now. The loans. So Doug, take us into a couple more, I think, and then, uh, then we'll probably wrap up. All right. That was a great question. And I like your idea of, you know, bringing up multiple low cost probes. So, so you don't get obsessed. Uh, Lucas, great question. John has, has a, a really deep question, Lloyd. All purposes are good not all are right. Being someone that has trouble listening to inner voices, how do I know I'm following the spirit? Should the path be easy? If it isn't, is that a sign that it isn't right? Yeah. Well, there's several questions in there, aren't, isn't there, <laughs> Cheryl? Um, so, what comes to your mind, Cheryl, as you listen to that? How, how have you navigated that journey? I just had this discussion today with my accountability partner. And I think one of the things that has happened, because I've moved away from the tyranny of busy and have stopped being so frantic as you are sometimes in the business world, that I think I've had more time to sit in, in a stillness and listen to what's happening. Um, I also had to learn very early on because I'm a, a three on the Enneagram, high achiever, and I had to say, not everything that comes from the Lord has your name on it. There are so many good, great causes out there, but you're not designed for every one of them and not everyone is for you. And so I've learned to listen more. I'm uh, more of a seeker of um of what i think that god is saying to me and sometimes it, it was wrong and i walked away and i learned from that experience what did you learn from that experience you know um a couple things come to my mind doug one is galatians 6 4 and 5 in the in the message translation it says um this is kind of our instructions around this question it says give careful thought to who you are and the work you've been given, and then sink yourself into it. 
Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of us must do the creative best we can with our own life. So, so there's a certain amount of thinking and processing that comes with try, with taking responsibility to do the creative best we can with our own life, um, depending on the spirit of God's guiding. Um, but but the careful thought to two things, who you are and the work you've been given, the who you are part is pretty analytical. First Peter, it says, get, each of you have been given certain strengths, be sure to use them. So what are my strengths? So I'd start with Strengths Finder and then start exploring what you're passionate about. One of the exercises we do that helps people narrow down their interests is a, is a photo exercise with like 500 different photos of every kind of human experience. And we ask people to go through them slowly several times and pick the three that most resonate with their heart by asking what makes me mad, sad, and glad, mad, sad, and glad. So those are some simple techniques that you can use. I spent time today with a group of people that had all gone through that exercise. And it was interesting to see how much it helped them narrow it down. Now, Henry now and the, the wonderful Catholic, author and um, who, who went from teaching in seminary to, to caring for 35 uh, disabled uh, handicapped people in Toronto and, and and has written some of the most powerful books I have read. He says in his book, Broad, The Bread, Bread for the Journey, he says, each of us has a mission in life. Jesus prayed to the father for his followers saying, as you sent me into the world, I have sent you into the world. We seldom realize fully that we were sent to fulfill God-given tasks. We act as if we have to choose how, where, and with whom to live. We act as if, I find this funny, we act as if we were simply dropped down into creation and we have to decide how to entertain ourselves until we die. But we were sent into this world by God just like Jesus was. Now, this is the part that I think relates to the question. Once we start living our lives with this conviction, we will soon know what we are sent to do. Now, that's one man's experience, right? But Henry Nowen is somebody that I that I, I trust. And it may be worth exploring. Is that, how will this help me if every day I wake up and say, Lord, you have sent me into this world. Show me where you want me to serve. And he promises I will guide you with my eye. So, some of it's experiential. Does it align with what he's written already in the Bible? Does Do our peers and do our friends around us and your mentor, do they affirm what they see in you like Peter Drucker did for Bob? I think that's how you triangulate you know, these issues around, around yourself to give you wisdom. And then over time, if it's not right, you can count on the Spirit of God to redirect you, I think. So one more question, then we'll wrap up. No, I, th I think that's our last one, and we may have lost Cheryl. I, I imagine she'll be back on momentarily. Uh, but, John, that was a great question. And, and, Lloyd, for me, it was whether doors opened up or not. When I, when I hit my low point and was up against the wall and had an idea, and I thought, well, this is either going to fly or it's not, and I proposed it uh, to a couple of people, and they said, that's a great idea. I will definitely join in mm. it was kind of like i mean it was a real answer to prayer because i was at a low point yeah so we want to thank everybody i hope cheryl will jump back on for our wrap up but lloyd this was just fantastic i think it's so important and i've talked to yeah. so many other halftime alumni that have struggled with this thank you for tackling this and studying it all through the summer and and do you see why i told you how much i admire cheryl I mean, isn't she just an amazing lady? And it's a strange combination of uh, amazing business prowess, courage, humility, de deep, loving commitment to people individually, you know, just um, wonderful blend. So I, I think we've all been blessed to learn from her today. And we will be sure to thank her on your behalf when we chat with her shortly. Absolutely. And I want everybody to remember this is recorded and you can get back to it at the very same link that we were watching it at. Uh, everybody that has joined this event will get the email and invitation for next month where we're going to talk about how to share your halftime message in a winsome way as our culture is changing. So Cheryl, I'm, I'm sorry you're not on screen. Hopefully you're, you're watching us here, but 
I want you to know I, she I, is. there you are. Awesome. <laughs> Just took a break. <laughs> <laughs> well, on behalf of the audience, I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to prepare and go through this and really share your heart. Uh, it's been so inspiring. It's been a joy. Yeah, and I, I had a little chance when you jumped off to brag on you a little bit, so you would you wouldn't have not enjoyed it anyway. So that's good. You <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> thanks, Cheryl. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. One of my one of my skill sets is not technology. <laughs> well, you did great tonight. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Take care.